All right. Well, welcome to the Alley Oop by Ontario Basketball. I love saying that. Um, we are so excited to have you guys join us. It is, of course, the Women in Basketball Celebration Month. My name is Amy Otterbert. I am a proud alumni of the OBA. Shout out to the Niagara Falls Red Raiders. I'm not going to say how long ago it was, uh, but enough about me. We are so excited and thrilled to be joined by one of our more prominent figures in Canadian basketball, the head coach of the University of Saskatchewan Huskies, and of course, our fearless leader for the, the uh, national, the Canadian Senior National Women's Team, Coach Lisa Tomitis, and we're going to bring her in here because her time is so precious uh, these days. So again, Coach, thank you so much for being with us. Everyone, if you guys have questions, it doesn't matter which platform you're on. I know it's on Facebook and YouTube. Go ahead and type them in, and we're going to do our best to get to them. But Coach, first thing right off the bat, the number one question these days, how are you doing and what is life like? Yeah, thanks so much, first of all, for having me on. I'm also a proud OBA alum um from the Hamilton region um but yeah you know I was saying like things feel a little bit better things are getting warmer out here in Saskatchewan the snow's melting um we're able to be outside so all things considered I'd say things are looking up uh able to get in the gym a little bit but um yeah certainly things could be better but they could be worse that's kind of our therapy, right? Just getting into a gym and hearing the, the net and the shoes and everything like that. Uh, and so correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you started playing basketball in Dundas, correct? Yeah. Yes. So Welcome very cool. So yeah. And, and so just the process of Dundas all the way to McMaster, the incomparable Teresa Burns. And what was playing in your younger days like? Oh, yeah. I mean, Dundas was not a hotbed of basketball at the time, although like there there weren't any club programs then, although I know, you know, Dundas Dynamo has taken hold and, and has done well and um, went to Highland Secondary, had some great female coaches there. Um, and, you know, they really had an impact on me and encouraged me to try out at McMaster. At that time, there wasn't a ton of recruiting going on, um, came, came into a program and into a team that had just won the bronze medal at Nationals. And so, they were a pretty strong program. And uh, honestly, I was thinking whether I should try out for volleyball or basketball, and I wasn't too sure. Um, I'm 6'2", so my height certainly helps. And uh, I figured I didn't really want to wear the short, tight shorts back then. So um, I went out for basketball, and, and thankfully they took me on the team. And yeah, uh, you know what? In my third year is when Teresa Burns came to the program, and and really that had a um, you know, significant impact on me. I think up until that time, I was a pretty average player with average motivation and average work ethic. And, um, you know, when she came to Mac, there was just something um, that she really, I, I guess, inspired in me to, to teach me how to work harder than I probably ever thought I knew I could. And one thing led to the next, you know, just kind of slowly got better. And, and I, I'd say the other part of the equation there was I had amazing teammates at the time. Um, you know, great players and 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 strong leaders that I looked up to, uh, especially when I was first and second year. People like um, Vicky Harrison and Tish Jeffrey and uh, Kathy Doucette and um, Heather McKay. Like we just had a fantastic group of of women at the time. And um, yeah, so finished up my career there, and um, it went on to put, well, actually went on to assistant coach with Teresa for a couple of years before I went on to play pro. So that was, that was kind of the start of it for sure. But definitely in the early days, just a ton of being outside, playing lots of different sports, had a hoop in our backyard, playing with my brother and um, really didn't focus in on basketball till a little bit later on. It would be, it would be deemed very late at this day and age. I want to ask you, you said coach Burns pulled some stuff out of you. Obviously it sounds like those are things that maybe you've carried with you throughout your entire career as a player and a coach. If you could kind of zone in on one or two of those things that you still really keep at your forefront, what would they be? Yeah, I think the big one was again, just the value of a strong work ethic and never being satisfied. I think, you know, I was, I was lazy. I'll say it. Um, again, just kind of relied on some innate talent, but, um, you know, wasn't, I wasn't going to overpower you with my physical abilities. I was a little bit more of a finesse player. I would say even at six, two, like to, like to shoot had decent range at the time. Um, so, you know, I, I was kind of one to easily give up. And so I think she just really inspired me to, um, to learn how to work hard and, and to persevere and, and what that would, the dividends, I guess, that that would pay in the end if if you did that and if that was part of who you were. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, she was highly motivational for me. Um, and again, you know, then you start to kind of get addicted to the, the work ethic, right? You start to put the time in, in the weight room, you start to see the results, you start to see the improvement in your game. Um, and then I think the other part with her is, um, really taught me how to think the game and, um, analyze it and try to outsmart your opponent. So again, like, um, I wasn't going to overpower people, but if I could be a little bit smarter and, and make up maybe for some deficiencies athletically, um, I was pretty into that. And I think that really led me down the path to, to think about coaching. I was going to ask what kind of player you were, but you kind of just gave us the scouting <laughs> report, which is awesome. You're coach now. And, uh, and I will ask, and I love asking coaches about this. Um, at, when you were playing, did you kind of have this in the back of your mind that this is what you'd want to do post playing or was this something that just organically happened? Yeah. Again, back then, um, when I was playing at Mac, you know, it would maybe enter into my mind that coaching would be, I mean, I'm, again, like I'm, I'm being coached by this tremendous, um, female leader and Teresa and, and you think like, wow, wouldn't it be awesome to, you know, maybe follow in her footsteps and, and be a coach one day. But at the time, you know, you look around and you see, a lot of coaches who were in the coaching profession for a long period of time and not a lot of turnover and very few opportunities um, that were popping up at that time. So it, it didn't really seem like a viable option for me. Um, so I was thinking, you know, of other things, maybe medicine or physiotherapy or, you know, who knows what. And, and I always kind of had my hand in coaching, you know, I coached the in OBA and with their like MDP, JDP programs at the time, and then assisted at Mac. But um, it wasn't probably until a little bit later on that I thought, okay, maybe this is something that I that I could pursue. Uh, and even then I took a lot of, I needed a lot of encouragement and a lot of prodding to even, you know, apply for the position at Saskatchewan at that time. You talked about later in your playing careers and professional player, obviously you get competitive and, you know, the juices really start flowing. So then to go from that to a coaching role, everyone kind of has a different uh, mindset or, or how they really made that transition. How did it work for you? Yeah. Um, again, like as an assistant at Mac early on, I mean, just great learning experience. So fun to still be involved in the game um, and then playing pro. And, and I think that's when I probably started to change my perspective a little bit. Again, you know, you, you learn from coaches that you really admire and have a great impact on you. And then you also learn from other coaches that maybe don't have that same impact or you think, or you learn about what you wouldn't do probably as much as, you know, what you would do if you were a coach. Um, but making that transition, you know, I was, I was hired at Saskatchewan uh, when I was 25, 26 years old. So I was very young. Um, I didn't know anything and I didn't know anyone in Saskatchewan. So the transition was uh, rough as far as, not having a ton of support, but just really sticking with, you know, I think young coaches, you coach how you've been coached. And, you know, I, I thought I had a pretty good foundation there as far as learning from Teresa. And, um, you know, I got thrown head first into it and in Canada West a conference at that time that had won, I think, you know, the previous 10 national championships. So we were going up against the likes of the UBCs and the UVICs and the Calgary's and Alberta's who were powerhouses at the time. Um, so you, you had to figure it out pretty quickly. And I think it was part of the reason why we were able to kind of climb the ladder fairly quickly is you you were up against tremendous competition every single weekend. So yeah, it was like sink or swim at that point. And I kind of want to, I want to talk about senior women's national team because obviously a head coach, but you started in 2001 as an assistant, correct? And so how does your role, what are the biggest changes in your role from being the assistant to, to the bench boss front of the line up there? Yeah. Yeah. 2001, I, I, I was so lucky. I got an opportunity as an apprentice coach and, and worked with Bev Smith at the time. And then the following year, I was able to move up the ranks and, and was one of a few assistant coaches. And like you said, um, I was an assistant coach, I think, for 11 years with with Allison McNeil. And, you know, it, it's not a coincidence that our, our program at Saskatchewan started to really improve during that time. Because being an assistant, I mean, it's it's an awesome opportunity to learn from people who are more experienced, um, you know, in that position, who know the game better than you do, who can teach the game better than you can, um, but also then be exposed to the international game and and see these different styles of play. You know, it's not like now when you can kind of turn on and, and tune into a webcast and watch a game in France or watch a game in, in Italy and, and see how those teams play. Like, it was very much... Um, 
to me, I thought it was like uh, a bit of a, like a secret weapon that we had in that I got to be exposed to these, these different styles of play. Um, but as far as like the changing role, um, again, like the assistant coach, you can, you can be the good guy all the time. Right. And, uh, the, the end decisions don't fall in your lap. And so you can have a ton of opinions and, and provide a lot of different ideas, but at the end of the day, as the, as the head honcho, so to speak, um, you know, it begins and ends with you. So if you make the wrong call, it's, uh, it, it's on you. It's not on anyone else. So definitely, um, you know, a lot more pressure. You kind of have to have a little, you're a little bit more removed from the athletes because, you know, at the senior national team level, it's, it's so, so competitive. Um, the majority of our players are pros. Everyone wants to be on the team. That's why they're there. And you're making, you know, decisions that are, um, you know, life changing for some, uh, in terms of se selection and, and also in the same respects, you know, when, when it comes to performance, um, and trying to achieve the things that we're trying to achieve. So it, uh, I've seen both sides for sure. And, um, both have amazing, you know, pluses and, 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 and minuses to them for sure. I want to get to those expectations soon, but before that, you show up to practice at the head coach at the University of Saskatchewan, or you show up with the women's national team. Uh, are, are, is your philosophy the same across the board? Do you have to change your style? How does that balance work? Yeah, um, it's been pretty similar, I'd say. Um, our styles of play is, are, are, are somewhat similar. Quite often, I'll, I'll use our University of Saskatchewan team as a bit of a um, testing ground or a, a test tube for what we do with national team. So that part is fun because I'll have some ideas and thoughts and then, you know, we can run it at that level and see how we like it and how it works. And then, um, you know, have a test run before we actually implement with senior team. But for the most part, I'd like to think that, you know, I show up pretty, pretty similar in, in both scenarios. Um, you know, the athletes at the university are obviously a bit younger for in most cases, um, but you do spend a lot more time with them. So you're probably a little bit tighter with those athletes um, just because you're, you're essentially with them 12 months out of the year and, and so many hours a day and you travel with them and you experience so many things and they're in a in formative years. Right. Um, whereas with national team, the majority are pros and, and, you know, they've, they've learned their basketball from someone different. Um, they've honed their game, they've played professionally. And, and so it's a little bit less about, I guess, um, you know, trying to make them individually better and more focus on just how you're going to mesh these talents uh, and make the team the best it can possibly be. But, um, you know, having said that, I'd like to think my approach is, is pr pretty similar in both scenarios. Uh, side note, what a recruiting tool. <laughs> I mean, if I was a young player and it was like, this is our Olympic team, we're ranked from the world right now, and we're going to try to run to the same systems, I'd definitely be, I'd be excited <laughs> to be a part of that. But we don't have to go there. But uh, let's go back forth in the world. I'm so excited for what this team can do. But we talked to Bridget Carlton a couple of weeks ago on this platform. And yeah. she spoke about the last time this team was together was just it was over a year ago when you qualify for Tokyo. Uh, I listened to an interview you did about one of the strengths of this program was the, the togetherness, the cohesion and chemistry. How do you mm -hmm. keep that going into this summer without actually having to have been together for so long? It's been an enormous challenge for sure. You know, um, like you said, about 13 months ago, we were together in Belgium and, and the team played really, really well, um, beat some quality opponents to qualify for Tokyo. Um, you know, how we felt then and then, you know, a couple of months later, or even just a month and a bit later to have it, you know, all be postponed. And at that point in time, we didn't know if it was actually going to happen in 2021. So it was it was pretty devastating at the time. Um, it was a couple months after that, uh, in the summer, we started, you know, having regular team meetings and team calls. And, and in some ways, you know, we do really hang our hat on our team chemistry and cohesion and ability to know one another. And that's in part, in large part due to the number of years that our athletes have played together in the summers. And so we'll be leaning heavily on that experience heading into Tokyo, but um, in the time that we haven't been able to be face to face, we have met regularly and we, we even had a virtual training camp uh, last month where we got together again, mostly on Zoom, but covered a lot of different items like technically, yes, um, for sure we did some film, but we also did a lot of other things that maybe wouldn't have been as prioritized had we been together. 
So, and also due to the pandemic, you know, um, with us not having a, a university season, I've been able to probably watch our play. Well, definitely I've been able to watch our players in their pro context play way more than I ever have in previous years and stay in much more regular contact with them um, than I ever have. So in some respects, we're probably, you know, tighter and closer um, right now than we ever have been just because of the constant communication and connection that we have, that we have um, deliberately done. Um, and our athletes have been amazing. You know, they've, they've completely bought into this. Um, I think they see the value in it as well. Their goals and dreams are, are just as strong as ever. Um, you know, we've set our sights on the podium and um, just because we haven't been able to get together, we're certainly not going to use that as an excuse or, or feel sorry for ourselves. We just, we, again, we have to be creative and we have to find different ways and, and, and figure out how we're going to achieve those dreams. Yeah, I think I speak for the entire country when I say we're so excited to see this team get out there because number four is also like an interesting spot, right? It's just off the podium. So it's kind of like, hold on. <laughs> um, so I'm so excited for you guys. And I know you still have a lot of business to do, but I do want to talk a bit about legacy. I mean, you mentioned Bev Smith and Alice McNeil and Teresa Burns, and these are some of the giants. These, when I was a young player, these were the giants. And, and you're one of the, you are one of them too now. And, and it's, so it's, I know your story is nowhere near close being done, but in terms of your legacy, what do you, what do you hope you're leaving with those young women out there that, that want to continue to grow this game? Uh, I think the biggest thing is just inspiring them to, to keep playing and to dream big, you know, um, with the national team, you know, I think we've continued to grow and, and improve the program over the course of, um, the last number of years, again, I've just played a small part in it. Uh, many others who've come before me helped get it to where it was. And then we just continue to, to carry on the trajectory that was already created. Um, yeah. And just, again, to believe that anything's possible and, and being a world power in women's basketball is, is a reality. And it's something that we want to continue to um, have that long-term and sustained success at. It's not just a flash in the pan. You know, we, um, at the Olympics in, in 2012, just seeing and understanding and, you know, recognizing that was probably one of the first times that our national team had um, national media coverage when we played in London. And prior to that, you know, there were very few people who had seen us play. Um, and then to see it evolve into where, where we are now, you know, the Mad Love cam campaign and the, the regular exposure and spotlight that we see, Sean, on our athletes and on our team, you know, it's just got to continue to get bigger and better. And so, again, I just, I, I hope it continues to take off. I hope that our, our team and our, our national team athletes continue to get the, the love that they deserve, the, uh, the attention that they deserve, and it just continues to grow from here. Yeah, the Mad Love campaign, you mentioned it, is incredible and ongoing. And I, I love it every day going on Instagram and, and reading somebody else's story. It's such it's such a great idea. Uh, but it, kind of to your point, we got to talk a little bit of about March. It is March. And if, you, if you're a gym rat, it's kind of one of our favorite times of the year, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, you were talking about Canada being one of the powerhouses. I mean, nothing says it more than all four number one seeds have a Canadian on that squad. And it kind of adds this, I think, extra layer of pride for us up here. Yeah. Um, and can you share? I don't know. I don't want to like put you in a bad spot, but maybe any predictions. I don't know if you fell out of bracket. What do you think, Af? Because there's really eight teams that could be number one seeds, which is crazy. Uh, what do Absolutely. you think? Absolutely. Uh, hey, I, I, I can't. Uh be taking any favorites at this stage of the game. <laughs> so many Canadians out there, like 27 in the tournament and, no. and one on each of the, the top seeds in the tournament. It's just, it's phenomenal to see. Um, it speaks volumes to, again, the talent that's coming up and, and continued to produce in Canada, um, that those players are playing roles on those teams, like they're being counted on. Um, they're not just, you know, filling a roster spot. So it's going to be really, really exciting to watch it. Um, yeah, definitely, like you said, this is the time of year where you settle in and sit in front of your TV for extended periods of time and just watch game after game. So uh, I'm going to be one of those people and 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 can't wait to see our Canadians just excel on, on the stage. Yeah, I agree. I, I can't really pick a favorite, but um, <laughs> let's just let's just hope one of them has a Canadian on it, right? <laughs> That's all I want. The exactly. odds are in her favor on it. Um, <laughs> I first and foremost just want to thank you for your time because I know it, as much as obviously COVID's changed everyone's lives, you're still very busy and especially with the summer coming up, um, can't say how excited we all are to take part and and watch uh, what you guys do because you you already made us proud, but I know job not done yet. So thank you so much for your time.
Thank you. And yeah, everyone else out there that's that's listened in, thank you. Um, don't forget to join us next week. Uh, we have Queen's assistant, Queen's University assistant coach, and the founder of Hooper's Loop, actually. My girl, I love her, Wumi Ag Agumbiade. So I can't wait to have her and chat with her. So get ready for that. But in the meantime, like Coach said, and she will make you run sprints if you don't listen, sit down on the couch and watch hoops. It's like the only time of year is acceptable to not go outside all day, basically. Uh, but yeah, so thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next week.